Heavenly Father, what a glorious night it is. What an what a awesome opportunity it is for us to come together, to gather, to uh, look at your word and to remember the, the glorious gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you sent your son to earth to, to live a life without sin and to die on a cross for us. I, I thank you for all of the saints that you have, you've brought here to gather together and for uh, those who, who maybe are a guest here and, and don't know you, don't have a relationship with you, I pray that your spirit would move in powerful ways as they would hear truth tonight and that uh, you would give them a, a heart and a spirit and a mind to discern that well, to think about it, to contemplate it, and ultimately to see you as the son of light, that, that you are the one that we can trust. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible, uh, why don't you grab it and go with me to John chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, there's a hardback black one in the pew in front of you. Uh, you can grab that and make your way into John 12, uh, kind of about two-thirds of the way through the beginning of the New Testament. Uh, you'll find it there. Uh, we have been, kind of catch you up for those of you who are guests or you haven't been in a while, uh, we've been walking through since the beginning of this year uh, a series which is, is just week by week taking a look at what's going on in John's gospel account. John was a disciple of Jesus who followed him around for some three years during his earthly ministry and then much later on, nearing the end of his life, he's going to write uh, this book of 21 chapters as we divide it now uh, that foretells and kind of accounts for all of his time spent with Jesus. And he, and he writes it with a really singular purpose. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believing you would have life in his name. That's what he concludes right at the end of his gospel account. And so we kind of walked through it, and we did so sort of aligning our schedule as we looked at the text to know that we would arrive uh, this last couple weeks here in the spot that Jesus is arriving into Jerusalem during the final week of his life and then deal with his crucifixion and his resurrection on Good Friday and Easter, the days in uh, our culture that historically commemorate those things, remember that this is when this happened. And so uh, we sort of aligned that. And so this past Sunday, we looked at a week that in Christian circles is known as Palm Sunday. Uh, it gets that name because as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem in the third year of his ministry, this was uh, one of several trips into Jerusalem, though he didn't reside in Jerusalem. He lived in the north, in the land of Galilee. Jerusalem was in the south. Uh, and every time he went in there, he just kind of had this tendency to stir up trouble, especially with the religious leaders in the area. And so uh, he would stay there for a while, and then he would leave and minister in Galilee, and then he'd come back again and do the same thing. Well, at this point, time. He enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, gets his name because as he's heading into town, crowds have gathered around. And, and the crowds have gained a level of excitement and enthusiasm and buzz about who this Jesus is that have caused them to take off their coats and to take palm leaves and lay them in front of Jesus on the path as he enters into town and they cry out, Hosanna, blessed is the name of the Lord, and they call him even the King of Israel. Here's the expectation that this Jesus who has, over the course of three years of ministry, turned water into wine. This Jesus who had walked on water. This Jesus who had fed some 5,000 people. This Jesus who had healed the blind and, and made the lame walk again. And even raised this man, Lazarus, from the dead. Was indeed the one who would come as their king. And so there's a great deal of excitement, even fanfare, if you will. Now, it's not the first time that this has been kind of the pull from the people around Jesus. They've, they've been trying to kind of make him king for some period of time now. And Jesus has sort of eluded, evaded, and resisted this. He's walked away from it. And over and over and over again, he's using this phrase, because my hour has not yet come, except something different happened this past Sunday. As, as he walks 
into Jerusalem for the final time, Jesus doesn't move away from the call of the crowd that he is the king of Israel. Instead, he presses into it. In fact, the Bible says that he actually sends his disciples to get a young donkey to ride in on so that his arrival would fulfill a prophecy from hundreds of years earlier that the king would ride in on a donkey's colt. And so Jesus kind of sees the crowd and begins to build into this excitement or fanfare until he actually speaks. And uh, we began in John 12 this past Sunday looking at Jesus speaking. And as the whole world, this is the accusation of the religious leaders, that the whole world has gone after him. And as the whole world is growing in excitement, even the Gentiles want to hear him. Jesus says now that the hour has come. And then he uses this really interesting phrase. For the Son of Man to be glorified. And then, then he says these kind of weird things like, like, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That if you love your life, you must lose it. And if you hate your life in this world, you will keep it into eternal life. And so he begins to almost sow some confusion in these crowds as he looks forward. And then where we pick up today, and I, wanna just, I just want to read you a few verses and talk about them. Uh, He says this in John 12, verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Then he asks this rhetorical question. Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And then he says this. Father, glorify your name. Bible says then a voice came out of heaven. From the Father. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Here's here's what Christians believe. The, The doctrine of Christianity is that God, the Father, is the creator of all things for the sake of His glory. That what God does, He does ultimately for the glory of His name. That because we know and serve a God who is completely good, completely holy, completely just, completely righteous, completely gracious in His fullness, that the greatest thing He could do is bring about all things for the glory of His name. That it's it's logical and then repeatedly throughout the Scripture. God's going to interact with human beings over and over, noting that what he does, he does for his name's sake, for the glory of his name. Now, what's what's fascinating about this is here we are on a day to commemorate the God of the universe putting his son, the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth is how John describes him, on a cross to die. And and I think the logical question we ought to consider is is how does does the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, one who lived without sin, the only Son of God on a cross, dying, glorify God? Because that's what he just said it was going to do. I have glorified it and I will glorify it Again, just just a couple verses later, John's going to note in verse 33, he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. And and notably, the crowd uh, is a little bit confused by this, as should we. In verse 34, it says, they answer and they go, hey, we've heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. The Christ, that's, that's what they referred to Jesus as, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the one who's just come, that we just tried to anoint you as. Uh, how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? How can you say you're going to die? Who then is the Son of Man? And so in this, I want to I just kind of look at this and note some of the things that Jesus says here because I think there's some ways that he helps us understand why today really is Good Friday. Why today really does glorify the name of God in the death of Jesus. I, I come up with four. I think if you're real smart and you read, you could come up with more than that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you four. And then, uh, fact, here's the challenge, right? 
you've got two days to read your Bible and, and look for some. You write them down if you want to. You bring them to me. That would be remarkably encouraging. I know most of you are not going to do it, so there's, <laughs> there's a free homework assignment. All right, four ways that Jesus notes that his crucifixion glorifies God. The, the first is this. Look back in verse 27. He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Then, then note this. For this purpose, I came to this hour. Here's the first. The cross fulfills the eternal promise of God of redemption. That, that from the beginning, God had intended to send Jesus to save through his sacrificial death. Over and over and over again, the Scriptures point to the coming of one who would save all of the Old Testament. What we know as Genesis through the book of Malachi is written giving this kind of layer of foreshadowing, this layer of truth, this layer of expectation that one would come to fix all of the brokenness, one that would come and make all of it right. In fact, even in the book of Genesis, if you go back to the very beginning, God creates the earth. He, big, he brings about all of these things. He creates man uh, almost immediately. Man sins and falls. And the Bible says, through that death spreads to all men. And then God, out of this, in Genesis 3, notes to the serpent, who's right there in the garden in the context of this sin, that there would be one from the seed of woman who would come and though you would bruise his, he his heel, he would crush your head. And he begins this redemptive purpose in showing that one day God was going to make things right through his son, through the death of Jesus. Now, not only this, uh, what you're going to find when you do this reading this weekend that some of you maybe will do if I harp on it enough, uh, is that over and over again in the final week of Jesus' life, you're going to find this phrase come up, that this was done to fulfill the prophecy or to fulfill what was written in the Scriptures. Because again and again and again and again, the things that Jesus did were shown hundreds of years earlier as him coming to do this. That he had come when he rode in on a donkey, it was to fulfill the prophecy in Zechariah 9, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 9, uh, when he is sold out by Judas, the Bible actually said in Psalm 41 that it would be one close to him who betrays him. Uh, Zechariah 11 tells us that it'll actually be for 30 pieces of silver, the exact price that Judas turns Jesus over for again and again and again. Even Jesus on the cross, as he speaks up, his final words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are from Psalm 22, which goes on like this, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For the dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evildoers encompass me. Listen to this. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, and they stare at me, and they divide my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. If you know your Bible well, you know that the crucifixion, Jesus' hands and feet Feet are pierced, and though a bone of his is not broken, they divide his garments and cast lots for them. And some 800 years before it was written, that's exactly what was going to happen. Not only that, uh, we are here in John chapter 12, the very next uh, chapter of the scripture describes the day before Jesus is actually led to the cross where he sits with his disciples. This is one of my favorite. You think about how much of the scripture just sets up for this very day, this very moment. He sits down with them to celebrate a meal that they had all gathered in Jerusalem for called the Passover. It, you see, it was a meal of remembrance. 
God's people were to remember a time when they were slaves in Egypt and God in His great glory along with His great mercy did not kill the Israelites but passed over them when each Israelite family would take an unblemished and spotless lamb and they slaughtered it. And they took the blood and they put it on the doorpost of their house and above the lintel of their door and there the death angel passed over them and spared them in place of the sacrificial blood of a lamb. And Jesus, when he sits down to that meal with his disciples, goes, you look back, but this is about me. He institutes what we know as the Lord's Supper. This is my body. This is my blood. The new covenant, which is for you, noted that it's always been about him. For this hour, for this purpose, I came. In fact, uh, one of his chief indictments just a few chapters earlier to the religious leaders is that they searched the scriptures because they thought that in them they had eternal life. And then he says this, it's these that testify about me that the whole of the Bible led up to this very moment. God is glorified because the cross was always the plan. Here's, Here's the second one. God answers in verse 28, and says, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd of people who stood and heard were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel had spoke to him. Uh, They're kind of confused by the whole of the situation, and Jesus answers, and he says, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. And then he says this, listen to this, now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Here's the second way the cross of Jesus Christ glorifies God. Because the atoning sacrifice of Jesus means that you and I who believe in him are not judged but saved. That judgment comes upon the world and that in Christ we don't stand judged. We don't stand condemned but rather we stand spared, pardoned, saved. The the Bible says it this way. Uh, In fact, Jesus, just a few uh, chapters earlier in John's Gospel, is having this conversation with this guy named Nicodemus, who's a religious leader. He's he's pretty uh, well off and high up in the circles of what it means to be self-righteous. And Jesus looks at him and says, God did not send his son, that's Jesus, into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged, and he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son, of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that that light has come into the world and that men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Can I uh, just surmise what the gospel message is, what, what Good Friday is all about? It is that there is a God who in his glory has created all of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And that this God is righteous and just and true. And though He is gracious and merciful, as He says in the Scripture, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And as Jesus warns, judgment is in the world. That it would be outside of the character of God and God's character by its nature necessitates that sin would not be left undealt with. It would be unjust. It would be wrong. It would be evil. And this ought to be both uh, a great thing for us and some of the worst news that we could ever imagine because we love justice for others. I, mean, I love justice when I'm sinned against. Right? You, you take from me, I hope you are put to justice. Uh, the illustration I always use is like when I'm driving down the street and I get cut off by a guy who passes me obnoxiously, I can't wait to see two miles down the road him pulled over in justice. But 
listen, when my cruise control is set nine miles too fast, give me mercy. Amen. Because here's the truth. We, we love justice, just not for us, because we are sinners. What's, what's worse is uh, the Bible says we are born in sin. I remember uh, shortly before we had our, our oldest, Clara, uh, Whitney and I had this kind of ongoing conversation that, that maybe many of you as parents have had before, and it's like, what does discipline look like? Uh, and not having kids, you know, the, the kind of popular idea of the day is like, the, well, do we spank our kids? Uh, do we, like, put them in time out? I didn't get that privilege, okay? Like, I, I feel like even vindictively, I was like, I'm not going to extend something like that to my kids. Like, I got swatted, and I just feel like, Payback, right? Like it's like hazing almost, you know? And so we were kind of having this conversation. I remember Whitney kind of looking at me and going, I just, I just don't know if I could bring myself to spank our child. It didn't last that long, all right? <laughs> because, because I can remember it so vividly. Here's what happened. At 11 months old, sitting in a high chair, our our sweet, precious, beautiful little girl is getting her like first kind of real dose in like human food, grabbing it with her hands and uh, eating these little puffs and sticking them like in her mouth. And then she finds out that the dog really enjoys these. Now, like this, these baby food things are like a container this big costs one hundred and eighteen dollars. So like. It's not that big of a deal that she's feeding them to the dog if somebody else bought them. But like I bought them. And so I look at her and I go, Clara, no. Clara, that, no. And she looks at me and she picks up this puff. And I said, Clara, no. And that was it. That, the, the conversation about how we punish our child was done. <laughs> it was decided, right? We, we knew right then and there. And, and here's what, what I still remember to this day, what is so amazing, is she didn't have to learn that. She, we, we don't have to learn how to be sinful. In fact, the, the very thing that you want to be is not what you are. You know this about yourself. What's even perhaps more frightening about it, in, in Romans chapter 2, Paul notes this, that God will one day judge the secrets of men. Listen, I, I live a relatively public life. Even if you're a private person, there are many people in your life that know you are quite sinful. And yet God says he's going to judge your secrets. And the thing that I know well about my heart that I can guarantee is true about yours, is the things that are in secret are worse than the things that are in the light. Amen? So here's, here's the thing. If, if you have a righteous God who, who will not deal with sin lightly and will judge the world and judge sinners, what do we do? Well, God glorifies himself. How? By satisfying his judgment, not through our justice, but through Jesus. Look what he says in verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. By this he indicated the type of death he was to die. That Jesus comes and draws his saints, draws his sheep to himself in his death. Just a few chapters earlier, uh, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10. My sheep, that's those of us who are in Christ, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish 
and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Here's here's the third. How is God glorified in the crucifixion? In it, God takes the judgment, His wrath that is due for us, and lays it upon His Son, Jesus. The Bible calls Him the propitiation for our sins, the just payment for our sins, the one who could satisfy all of our sin, all of our wrongdoing, all of our guilt paid for in the cross of Jesus Christ. That in His death, He draws to Himself those who know Him. Look at this. Uh, He goes on. They're confused by this, and they go, "Uh, uh, the Son of Man must be lifted up. What are you saying? Who is this? And Jesus answers them this way. For a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. But while you have the light, now listen to this. How, How do you have this pardon? How do you have this atonement? How do you have this reconciliation that comes in Jesus' death on the cross paying for your sin? Believe. Believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. It really is that simple. That the message of the cross, that Good Friday in its fullness is that God in His love And for the glory of his great name, put Jesus on a cross to die so that he might take on the wrath, take on the punishment that was due for you and I in all of our sin, paid in full in Jesus Christ. And how do you respond? You just have to believe. You just just have to place your faith in Him instead of yourself. You just have to trust it. And you will become sons of light. It was around midnight last night that Jesus and His disciples are in a garden in Gethsemane. Judas had sold Him out and they arrived to arrest Him. The Bible tells us that Peter, one of his disciples, uh, chooses to fight in his zeal, actually cuts off a guy's ear, kind of quick little footnote. Jesus picks it up, cleans it up, sticks it back on, goes, stop. Didn't come to fight here. Jesus is arrested and taken off about 4 a.m. till about 6. Jesus is brought before Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests of Israel, At that time, they interrogate him in a mockery of a trial that had already been decided. Jesus tells them that they will see him, the Son of Man, sitting at the right hand of power. They claim it's blasphemy that he indeed is calling himself equal with God and that he is worthy of death. They spit in his face. Those who held him in custody blindfold him and begin to hit him, yelling, prophesy, who is the one who struck you? That same Peter who had the sword just hours earlier and said, if all will leave you, surely I won't, denies Jesus three times and then heads off to weep bitterly. From six to eight, Jesus is moved, taken from Annas and Caiaphas, brought before Pontius Pilate, the governor tried there, sent to Herod to be entertained, and then back to Pilate. Pilate, not sure why he's involved in the whole picture, finds no guilt in Jesus, attempts to have him released, but the crowds cry out, release Barabbas for us instead. Pilate washes his hands, says okay, and hands Jesus over to be crucified. 8 a.m. to about 8.30, Jesus is tasked with carrying his own cross to a place called the Skull, Golgotha. 
he actually has to enlist the help of Simon the Cyrene as he is now weak from the scourging and the beatings. 9 a.m., the third hour in the Jewish calendar, Jesus is hung on a cross, criminal to his left and a criminal to his right. For the first half hour from 9 to 9.30, the soldiers divide his clothing, casting lots while Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. From 9.30 to 11, those same soldiers mock Jesus while he's on the cross, claiming, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. Come down. From 11 to 12, Jesus speaks to the criminals on his left and his right, assuring one that he will be with him today in paradise. He looks to his mother and says, behold your son. To John the disciple, behold your mother. At noon, Darkness descends the land of Israel. Sometime between noon and three, the earth quakes and the veil in the temple that separates the very presence of God from the people is torn from the top to the bottom. At 3 p.m., Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it is finished and gave up his spirit. Sometime before nightfall today, some 2,000 years ago, the soldiers stick a spear into his side where the blood and water comes out, and his body is taken down from the cross. It's given to a man named Joseph of Arimathea, laid in a nearby grave and sealed with a large stone rolled in front of the grave. And the followers of Jesus enter into the darkest, saddest Sabbath day of their life. But Sunday's coming. Lord, glorify your name. You have and you will do it again. We're so thankful for the cross. I pray that you are glorified in all of us that we would believe and be sons of light. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.